Media. I am partner and VP of content, and I'm excited to have you back for another Q&A show. Today we're going to be talking about data protection and specifically um, data protection for modern applications. And I think this is going to be a really fun chat, um, not just because it's a hot topic, but because I've got a really fun guest who is well suited to uh, discuss this. And so we'll start there. My guest today, Niraj, um, is a data protection for cloud native applications expert and uh, actually an expert on storage in general. And so, um, Niraj, I'd like to start by just asking you to introduce yourself to the audience, please. All right, happy to do so. So excited to be here, James. Uh, glad to be talking to all of you again. And just in terms of brief introduction, Niraj told you, I, till recently, I was a CEO and co-founder of the startup called Kasten. Uh, a few weeks ago, we announced that we had been acquired by Veeam, so really looking forward to that. Just in terms of my background, um, I've been in the storage and data management space for a long time. I worked on my PhD on data deduplication at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here in the US, and been working on storage systems and backup systems ever since then. And we, over the last four years or so, we spent quality time at CAS and focusing on enterprises and solving the data management challenges with containers and Kubernetes. So as the next generation of applications evolving, when you go look at microservices, cloud native applications, how do you protect the data that's valuable to consumers, to the users, to the developers of the application from a disaster recovery, backup and recovery and app mobility perspective. So in short, that's both what I have been up to over the course of my career, as well as what Caspin has been doing over the last few years. Excellent. So <clears throat> we're going to start by talking about data protection and disaster recovery. But uh, another interesting area I want to push into that you mentioned there is application mobility. One of the things that's interesting to me is how um, those two things are sort of becoming, the line between the two is becoming a little bit blurry, where we're starting to see a lot of data protection sort of utilities applied to application mobility. So I'm excited to ask you a little bit more about that later. Mm -hmm. Let's start, though, by just talking about um, the state of infrastructure and applications in general. It's not going to be a surprise uh, to anybody watching that things have changed quite a bit. Um, and the first question I have for you is about that change. We've seen a lot of change in the way we build and manage infrastructure, and that is to support the, the changing types of applications we've seen. I'd like to get your opinion. Do you think that the changing face of applications is driving the change in infrastructure, or do you think the changing way we want to do infrastructure is causing us to build applications differently? So it, that's a great question, I think, particularly to kick this entire session off. I think for me, this was roughly six years ago in 2015 when I first encountered Kubernetes. And the light bulb that went off for me was, this is an infrastructure platform that doesn't care about infrastructure, doesn't care about vendors. It cares about developers, it cares about applications. And I think it's the right decision to make. And that's what's been driving the growth of Kubernetes is application developers, application requirements, asking infrastructure to conform to their needs, whether you talk about scale, performance, reliability, resiliency, and the infrastructure responding to that versus infrastructure vendors saying, here's infrastructure, use it and work around our constraints. So I really do believe for now and for the next number of years, it's gonna be developers and applications driving what infrastructure looks like, behaves as, compared to the old view of doing things. Some people might say that essentially the infrastructure doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, all that matters is the applications we're building. Would you 
concur with that or is there value in, in the infrastructure itself? I think there's a tremendous value in the infrastructure, but for better or for worse, some of that is being abstracted away, which I again think is the right thing to do. We can talk about innovation and where that happens and how common APIs is a great place to have innovation above and below that. But I do believe that portability is a big thing in the multi-cloud world that we live in with people having on-prem presences, being up, deploying the application in multiple public clouds. Having infrastructure be abstracted away is a great thing for developers. So I'm actually very hopeful that the trend will continue over the next few years. So you mentioned Kubernetes a couple of times, and that's going to be a major focus of our conversation here. Um, it's sort of all of this revolves around the Kubernetes space. Based on what you're seeing, all the customers that you speak with, and you know, you're, I gather that your perspective is probably somewhat shifted towards the Kubernetes audience, but what's your general mm -hmm. sense of Kubernetes adoption across the board, especially in you know business critical sort of production use cases? So another great question. So I think there are two ways to look at this. There's a lot of buzz. Uh, there's some, you know, small amount of hype to run Kubernetes and containers in the community. But that said, I think the platform has matured enough that when we look at customers, and obviously I'm biased, the production use cases in pretty much all companies out there. Today, it is rare to find a company that has not deployed Kubernetes, at least in testing, right? And production's moving forward to, right? Even as a small company at Kasten, we had Fortune 10 and Global 10 companies, and these are conservative, not tech companies. And if they are doing this, so really is the rest of the world, right? So the platform is ready for running applications. People have confidence in it, and they're going forward with doing it. A lot of services we depend on, on our phones today, et cetera, are backed by Kubernetes today. But that said, still very early days, right? I look back at the early days of VMware, and that's the parallel I draw, you know, in the 2003, four time frame. A lot of excitement in the community, but I think the majority of growth is in front of us versus behind us. So a few years from now, when we look back at this time, we're going to say, right, oh, we were living in the moment, but that was the early days. So for those folks who are still holdouts, um, maybe they've deployed in tests and they are not ready to move this to production, what is it that's keeping them there? What's still hard about deploying Kubernetes in production? Another great question. So I think there are two things to think about here. So first of all, there's the technical aspect of things. Kubernetes is a different system, different platform, new concepts that people need to understand, both from the op side of things as well as from the dev side of things. So those sometimes you want the first deployments on the platform to be successes, and therefore it might take a little bit longer. But the other side of that is also a cultural or people thing, where because things have changed, roles have changed, silos have broken, it's what you talked about earlier, app mobility and DR and backup coming together. How does all of that fit in together? And how, does, how do teams evolve? I think those are some of the things that are holding things back implementing CICD process, right? For people that are in the tech space, we live in a bubble, it seems like everyone has CICD in place, but no, the things that need to be there for applications being deployed and Kubernetes succeed. Some of it's a cultural thing, some of it's a technology thing, some of it's a process thing, but you don't want to force it, otherwise you will run into failure scenarios. Makes sense. Okay, let's go ahead and move on, start talking about data protection, which is really, uh, bread and butter of, of what you're doing at CAST. And so mm -hmm. I want to spend most of our time there. I imagine you've got lots of great insight here. Um, you know, th there has been a lot of talk over the last decade about building applications that are resilient despite failures in the underlying infrastructure, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of ways, I think the goal. I think there's mm -hmm. a danger in thinking that way though, that can make you a little bit flippant. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is, just because the application can tolerate a failure doesn't mean we don't have to protect data. So um, mm -hmm. talk to us just a little bit about the, the, your general thoughts on protecting data in cloud native applications. Yeah, so 
You know, Kubernetes is a platform I wish I had 10 years ago when I was building my the last product because it would have solved so many things in terms of the reliability you mentioned in terms of the fault tolerance aspect of things. But the thing that we need to constantly remind ourselves is replication is not resiliency, right? Whether you talk about it at the infrastructure level or at the data service level, so especially when things like data are concerned, right? If it's stateless, easy to bring back, you're good, you're golden. But as soon as you start getting into somewhat more complicated nature of things, maybe you have replicated storage system or you have Cassandra that's storing data for you, then if you accidentally drop a table, that spreads across all the infrastructure. You have no other copies of it. You really want that backup in place. And today in the security conscious world we live in, ransomware is a big deal. Everyone's getting attacked by that. Having backups that will protect all your data in an offline manner or in a separate fault domain is going to be critical for these things. So it's great that infrastructures were reliable today and that applications don't make any assumptions about that in the aggregate, but you still need that backup. Otherwise, six months down the line in production, you might be in an extremely sticky situation. Let's talk about the difference between backing up these sorts of applications and say backing up a virtual machine. Um, it really mm -hmm. is not that complicated to, you know, snapshot a vir virtual machine, make a backup of the snapshot. There you go. I, I don't mean to be, there, there's a lot of magic that goes on under the covers and I know that, yes. but mm -hmm. I think it's a bit of a different beast to protect, say, persistent volume on a mm -hmm. container. And there's different considerations. So um, tell those of us who are not experts in that area more about that. But so if you're coming from the virtualization side of things, what we're going to start seeing is that you're used to a model where a VM or a set of VMs contains a single application or a collection of components. Now, Kubernetes, often and majority of the time deployed on VMs itself, changes that entire model because for a few different reasons. First of all, your app can get deployed on any VM and multiple apps get deployed on the same VM. So if you snapshot a backup of VM anymore, it doesn't mean anything. You might have four components of four separate applications, and you don't know how to stitch those back together to resurrect the one application you talk about. There's obviously no consistency in there. And that's just at the infrastructure level. But the big thing is, let's say ransomware attacks you. How long does it take you to even get back? Mm -hmm. Or if you have an accidental data outage. The problem is that now it's not just your infrastructure. It's not your data that sits on disks. We've seen a two order of magnitude increase in the number of objects that need to get protected now in the cloud native world, in the Kubernetes or container world, where things that used to reside on disk, think of this as certificates, configuration, your SSL certs, your secrets, those now become Kubernetes objects. You really need to understand the application, which is what has made Kubernetes powerful and successful to be able to restore that quickly within a matter of minutes or seconds. So if I don't understand how to protect all these components, if I can't scale my backup system, because now there's a two order of magnitude change, and right, I do not understand how to stitch all of this together in the right consistent manner, recovery will fail horribly too. So I think there are just so many differences. And that's why even as a young company, we succeeded against companies that have been doing this for 30, 40 years at this point in time. Because it's just a fundamentally different platform when you look at cloud native technologies. Yeah. Um, we talked at the top of the show about application mobility. And I mentioned mm -hmm. that we're seeing lot of uh, the use of data protection tools to enable mobility. Tell, tell the audience more about that. Why is that? And, and how are you able mm -hmm. to marry the two so elegantly? Yeah. Um, so the way at least I think about this is I mean, does, when we talked about the shift, when we talk about silos breaking down, now people don't want three different solutions, one that does backup, one that does DR, one that does mobility. I mean, the teams have consolidated and they're saying, once I capture data, how do I make use of it in multiple different places? Uh, whether it be for test dev purposes, whether it be for performance upgrades, cross cloud migration, DR, recovery. And so you want that to be under the same umbrella for ease of use. And that's something we focus squarely on. The other thing that we see that increases the need for app mobility is customers really are using multiple clouds. No one's moving apps around on an hourly basis. 
But what people are looking at is how do I get portability if I need to do that? And the deployment model has shifted. Instead of customers saying, I want to deploy three vSphere clusters or a couple, they're deploying 50, 100 Kubernetes clusters for different reasons. And with that, you will get an increased need for mobility that you didn't see in the virtualization world that we just spoke about a couple of minutes ago. So I think that's why one needs to ensure that how do we help people that are the pointy end of the stick, the DevOps persona, that is now faced with multiple different demands on their time and skills and help them do it all together. So a comment and another question. Um, if my memory <laughs> serves correctly, it took until like version six of vSphere to be able to just take a VM from this cluster and pop it over into this cluster. And you're basically saying because of the way we deploy Kubernetes clusters, it can't be that way. We have to we have to be able to do that easily, move applications around. Um, the question mm -hmm. is, why why uh, do Kubernetes clusters multiply like rabbits? So, <laughs> such a great question, right? Some of it is it's become easier to do, right? And sometimes when you make technology easy, people will find new ways to leverage that for what they want to do, which is ultimately helping the end users of the software they build. But the other thing is when you look at it, people are sometimes saying, hey, for compliance reasons, I'm just going to do a single app per cluster, as an example. Or they're running in just so many places. We have customers running across the world, across multiple AWS availability zones and regions. And so for that, it's a business requirement, given how companies are transforming, given how companies have a global footprint of where their end customers are. So that's, again, to improve performance for the end user of your software, that becomes a requirement. So we're seeing it's, and then when you do the cross product of that, that suddenly starts blowing up very quickly. So we have seen that pattern, right? And the way I look at it is the customer is right and they're solving real world problems for themselves. So one could argue it's better to have one large cluster, but then smaller clusters have so many benefits from the security, from the failure blast radius perspective, from the compliance perspective. And if, and as, Kubernetes has made it easy to do. Why not just go do it? That's a great point. I, I was trying mm -hmm. to answer that question in, in my head before I asked it. I thought of the security thing. The blast radius thing is something I had not thought about. So yeah, that's that, mm -hmm. if it's easy to do, why not just have more? Uh, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on and talk about disaster recovery some, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, we need to have good data protection tools but having all my data protected and sitting there offline is not that useful. I also need to be able to bring my stuff back online. How is protecting cloud native applications from a resiliency and recovery standpoint different than legacy applications? I think one of the big thing is when you go look at legacy applications, sometimes you'd see very full blown disaster recovery plans that specified what the app was, what the resources were that it need, depended on, making sure it existed on the other side. And some of that's changed because applications are being updated on an hourly basis, at times, sometimes on a daily basis, weekly basis. These things change so often, you can't have a fixed DR plan in place. All of these things need to be dynamic. The requirements from DR, from a cost perspective, from a data outage timeline perspective, all of those have also changed. Alongside the fact that now your dependencies are different because you need to understand the application. Say you're running in a public cloud, maybe SSL certificate comes from the cloud provider. How do you request that dynamically on the other side? Do you do it upfront? Do you do it post fact? Do you update DNS? And all of these things have become integral parts of the app. So when you go look at it, because the developer now controls infrastructure, the same DR systems don't work anymore. You need something that understands infrastructure as code. You need something that understands the dynamic nature of these apps as they scale up and down and figure out what needs to be replicated versus not. So it's actually, in some ways it's simplified because Kubernetes gives you portability, but in other ways it becomes somewhat of a more complex problem. So, um... I can think of a couple of possible ways to interpret what you're saying needs to happen. And I want you to tell me which, if either one is correct, or maybe maybe it's neither. So mm -hmm. one option is basically you could have 
the runbook become dynamic. And so it almost sort mm -hmm. of builds itself. It evolves as the application changes, the runbook changes, and it's just always mm -hmm. up to date. That's maybe yep. something we could. Uh, another way to interpret what I was hearing is there almost is no runbook. It basically just either never goes down or it's self-healing to the extent that as soon as there's a failure, it's fixed before there's a need to fail over or you know recover at mm -hmm. all. Are either of those things accurate? I think both of them. Unfortunately, right, like with all computer systems, the answer is always it depends, which is not a great answer, but uh, that is the reality of the situation. Where for what we have tried to do at Kasten, and this is based on a lot of customer feedback, is we've done in some sense both. That is support for the second part, support people building out these distributed data services, distributed applications. So it's hard because speed of light is a real thing when you spread across the world. So the constraints on what you can do there. But the run book needs to be expressed instead of the infrastructure level of the resource level, the application level. So for what we do for DR is we allow the customer to say, this application or things that match these constraints needs to get replicated. And then we materialize that as the application changes, we update that dynamically. So what the user has tried to say is, this app should be replicated in another cluster at this interval without specifying the components or resources. And as things get added or removed, that policy gets updated dynamically and it impacts the DR scenario. And I think that's the only sane way of doing it. No one is going to track 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 objects in a Kubernetes cluster, which is what we sometimes see today. Okay. Not possible. So not possible. something that's not going to be lost on anybody watching this is the changing infrastructure and applications that we talked about at the beginning of the show is impacting what skills they need to do their job. It's impacting their role, meaning what they're tasked mm -hmm. with and what they're responsibilities in the organization are. Can you just paint like in broad strokes how you're seeing roles change for IT people? And uh, I think our audience has a lot of kind of ops people in it. Mm -hmm. um, how they interface with developers is changing too. What are you seeing there mm -hmm. in, in that regard? There's so many things. Let's be honest, because this was the same thing for me. This change is scary. Um, this change, you give up some control as an ops person, right? As a person that was responsible for infrastructure in a previous group I ran, switching to Kubernetes meant anyone could do what they want. And when you're used to a ticket filing system to get infrastructure or a change control process, all of that goes away. But on the flip side, I think people in the ops world and the IT administration world can now up-level their jobs, right? There's a learning curve, yes, but the tools that make it easier now compared to say 18 months ago. And the focus is now on how does one do self-service? How does one have the safety net under developers? How does one have better monitoring observability in place, better auditing in place? So I think there's a shift that needs to happen where you say, how do I switch my focus from building out infrastructure for applications and developers to making a fully, ideally 100% automated self-service infrastructure allows the business to move faster. The ops person will actually look like a hero to other people. And we've seen this at customers where the developers, the application owners are looking at operators with a new esteem because they're suddenly now empowering developers versus slowing them down. That is a very encouraging message for a lot of people who I think mm -hmm. are worried that you know either either they'll be replaced or displaced or they won't be able to keep up. I think there there certainly is that opportunity if you don't mm -hmm. keep an eye on. It. There's also the opportunity, like you said, to become the star and to enable mm -hmm. the business. Um, always yeah. good for employees. Yes. Um, so. This may be a hard question to answer because you've been thinking about this space for such a long time, but um, your background is in storage, right? Um, mm -hmm. You've done some like super nerdy storage subsystem research uh, mm -hmm. and you're familiar with like the, the world that a lot of our people live in, enterprise applications, big storage mm -hmm. array, whatever. Yep. Do you remember that anything was particularly helpful in 
kind of evolving into thinking about applications the way you do today? Or to ask that question in an easier way, do you have any advice for people looking to make that leap? Sure. I think here's the thing. Storage isn't going away. All meaningful applications are staying. The two cents that I would have as advice here is how does one leverage what one knows into this new world? Because there are a lot of new application developers that are coming in that really don't understand storage. We'll ask people what storage system they use. We don't get back NetApp or EMC. We'll sometimes hear Cassandra, MySQL. People don't understand how to protect this. People don't understand what it really means to use it, consume it, what quality of service looks like. And I think folks that are used to traditionally what has been big iron, look, explore what software defined storage, even if it's a layer on top of the big iron you currently deploy looks like. Explore how to help enable these new develop, developers that are coming in that haven't had that scar tissue that you have today. Because that scar tissue is so, it's priceless in a large organization. And there's so much value those folks can bring to the new world, so as to speak, that I think great any organization that ever thinks about displacing or replacing those people, you know, needs to go re-examine what they're trying to do. Yeah, so I want to wrap up by talking about this uh, because I've been having the same thoughts, and we're seeing this in all the folks that we're talking to. There is there is certainly the potential that mm -hmm. um, as an operator, I could I could fail to evolve. Um, however, we're seeing a lot of what you're saying, which is kind of cloud native application experts who have never known anything different and mm -hmm. don't even understand that there's three layers below MySQL. And so yeah. while on one hand, there is a little bit of a risk in not evolving, on the other hand, it's going to be hugely valuable to have the skill set that understands from that part in the stack down because there's so many people involved who don't. So mm -hmm. I, I want to talking about what's not going to change and where can where can operators sort of create or maintain value for themselves by understanding the parts of the infrastructure that won't change. So you just said yep. any meaningful application is always going to have state. Mm -hmm. What what is there in the infrastructure that, you know, it might look a little different, it might iterate, but what's not going away? Storage for one obviously. How about hypervisors? Mm -hmm. Does hypervisor go away? No, right? There's a lot of talk of bare metal, but I think a lot of the fundamental components are going to stay the same. People that have expertise in those will continue to be valuable. But like with all things, some of the value is shifting upwards in the stack. So my advice is, again, leverage the strengths people have and then see how do we help the layer on top of us, whether it be the Kubernetes platform layer that runs on the infrastructure we're responsible for. Again, all of that needs a place to run and needs to be reasonably reliable, right? Um, how do I support some of the application needs? How do I learn more about clouds? So I think there is a lot of position of strength people can leverage to branch to the next level up the stack. So if no matter where you are, whether you're looking at hypervisors, look at Kubernetes, if you're being in the networking field, look at software-defined networks, how they work in the container world. If you're in storage, look at software-defined storage. Um, and there's an immediate immediate adjacency that's next level up that if you quickly come up to speed on will be very powerful in terms of driving someone's career in terms of driving opportunities for them so something i think about a lot is mm -hmm. that you can find value in intersections and what i mean by that is for mm -hmm. for your career for starting a business for anywhere where you're trying to create value there are these mm -hmm. unique intersections and it's it's at that intersection there's a lot of value. So just as an example that's always top of mind for me, actual tech media is expert marketers and IT people. And either one of those mm -hmm. by themselves are a dime a dozen, but the intersection is where the value is at. Um, an example that I can think of for a lot of people watching who are concerned about keeping up is like if you can be at that intersection where you, like we've been talking about, your knowledge of the existing infrastructure systems can be married with knowledge of cloud native applications and you know how to talk to both types of folks and how to help the business connect the two things. There's almost more value in that than on either side of it. Would you agree with that? 
I would definitely agree, right? Some of the leaders that we see within what the now big groups have been called DevOps tend to be people that have managed vSphere, OpenStack, other hypervisors in the past, right? Folks that have been now charged with, build me the platform for the next 15 years of my company. And they're the people that have leveraged that, but figured out a way to learn enough about the new world to be dangerous, right? And that's what one needs. You will learn more as you go along, as you get more experience. Uh, with the platform. But as long as you have that base knowledge that's easy to pick up today, relatively speaking, it, you will be well empowered to take the next steps uh, in exactly the intersection, James, you just spoke about. So I'm encouraged by this chat. I hope if you're watching and you have some of these concerns, I hope you're encouraged too. I think um, it, this is an area where there's been a lot of worry. I might even, it might be a little strong, but fear um, for a lot of people, and I think the message that I want our chat to convey, besides that um, protecting cloud native apps is uh, easy with Kasten, <laughs> is that there's so much opportunity in this space. Like you don't, not only do you not have to be worried, but there is a wealth of opportunity to be had there. And if it were me, I would be chasing that intersection. That's just that's my advice. So Niraj. Um, by way of wrapping up, I've got one last question for you here, which I didn't have a good mm -hmm. flow, uh, a spot in the chat to slot this in, but I really want to know what you think. So I mentioned hypervisors a minute ago. You said that's not going away. Mm -hmm. We've been talking a lot about containers. Uh, both of those are good examples of abstractions. And over time, mm -hmm. we have added abstraction layers into the infrastructure and application stack to make things easier to manage or to make them more efficient. Mm -hmm or whatever it is. So, um, you know, early days of VMware, we abstracted physical machines with virtual machines with the hypervisor. What we've been talking mm -hmm. a lot about today is basically abstracting um, applications, more or less, like the different components mm -hmm. of applications into a description that Kubernetes knows about and manages. Containers mm -hmm. abstract the operating system. My question for you today is, we seem to keep adding abstractions. Is there a, a place where you see in the future us adding another abstraction layer anywhere in that stack, or have we reached peak abstraction? There's a joke in distributed systems that there's no problem yet another layer of abstraction will not go solve. Okay. okay. And yeah. the joke exists because in some sense it's somewhat true, right? If I if we really rewind the clock back, right? Disks didn't used to have a common abstraction. But now, you know, there was IDE, SCSI, and that allowed innovation underneath it. Right? Whether you look at flash vendors, whether you look at other storage systems, common abstraction, POSIX as an example, or NFS as another example of an abstraction. That really benefited. Now, but if you notice, we constantly, earlier abstraction becomes quote unquote boring. Still innovation happens underneath it, but then it moves to the next layer up. And how does it simplify life or enable us to build the next generation of applications? So will there be yet another layer of abstraction? The answer will be yes. But my goal, right, and people in the community is how does Kubernetes become invisible, right? Kubernetes is infrastructure to build other platforms on top of it, whether you talk about serverless platforms that have their own API, whether you talk about other PaaS style solutions or platform as a service, uh, whether you talk about other specialized platforms, think, right, Kubeflow for deep learning, uh, you, we will see more abstractions emerge that are application-centric as the world is moving, more abstractions emerge that are, have a better developer experience. I think we can still do a better job as far as developer experience goes. So I think we will see more abstractions, but it's going to be more meaningful to the large body of developers and operators out there that the goal is to make their lives easier. Man, I wish we had another 20 minutes that I could probe on that, but <laughs> fortunately we are out of time. Um, so thank you everybody for joining today. Thanks Neeraj for being on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Um, if you're watching and you want more information on topics like this one, we've got a full library of Gorilla Guides at gorilla.guide. Those are free to you. So you can go over there and download a Gorilla Guide at gorilla.guide. Um, we've also got a constant stream of events that cover topics like this one that are also free to you. Um, you can register for those and see the whole library over at events.actualtechmedia.com. And we would love to have you join us on one of those events. They're a whole lot of fun. There's multiple events every week. So check those out. If you want to learn more about Kasten, 
check them out at Kasten.io and follow them at HQ. And finally, um, if you're watching and you're an IT vendor and you want to do your own Q&A like this one, I'm always looking for guests. Uh, as you saw, Neeraj and I just had a whole ton of fun and I'd love to do the same thing with you. Drop us a note at uh, connect at actualtechmedia.com and we'll get it set up. Neeraj, any parting thoughts for the audience on uh, anything we've talked about today? So only one thing I'll say is, right, if people are going through this career change, if people have questions about Cloud Native, feel free to personally reach out to me. You can find me on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, et cetera. Reach out to me, drop me your questions. I'll be happy to help. But I'm excited about the space we are in. I hope you've learned a little bit more about Cloud Native infrastructure. I hope you spend a little bit of time looking into it if you haven't already been. But yeah, feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. We'll be very happy to help. And James, thank What's you so here? much for having me here today. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, at Neeraj Tolia. So there you go. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Thanks, Neeraj. But yeah, Thanks just everybody. punch my name into Google. You'll find me. There you go. We'll see you all next yeah. time. <laughs>